Welcome, everybody. Our goal today is to cover implications of the FDA guidance for a risk-based approach to monitoring. Just a little bit about my background. I've been in the industry for almost 19 years now, and I've worked as a study coordinator, as a CRA, project manager, auditor, director, trainer, and specifically as related to risk-based monitoring. Over the past few years, I've been involved in a number of both sponsor and CRO initiatives to sort of formalize this in terms of their SOPs, how do they roll it out, how do they train their CRAs, what are the challenges we face with very experienced CRAs and new CRAs, making sure that they can still see the big picture when they're being asked to, to focus on certain data points. So we'll talk about how we get to those certain data points, but that's just some of my experience in it. I've also had the pleasure of working with the Transcelerate group who published a position paper on this. Uh, just last year, and we have provided that paper as a reference, and I'll talk a little bit about some of their methodology as well and sort of how that builds off of the FDA guidance, but Barnett has been very involved in a number of different organizations, and I myself has been very involved as both a project manager and as a director in terms of trying to roll out some of these concepts, so I'll try to bring you some examples, and, and uh, certainly if you have questions, ask them. If I don't have the answer, I will try to get an answer for you, even if it's not my area of expertise. We do have a wealth of subject matter experts that I can call on, and there's just a number of different resources in the industry that I can try and pull from. Our objective for today is part of our slide deck to discuss the content of the guideline, including the relationship to traditional monitoring plans, assess the implications of the guideline to current monitoring practices and relationships with oversight of clinical investigators, and explain ways in which the regulatory climate is reflected in the new monitoring guideline. And it's not so new anymore, but the way that sponsors are rolling this out and the way sites are perceiving it and the way CROs are implementing it really varies from organization to organization. And I've seen it happen in terms of let's try one small study as a case study versus let's go ahead and implement an SOP and we're going to roll this out broad base. It's new in the sense that we don't have a standard way of doing this. And we still don't have a tremendous amount of case studies or data back from how this is going. So there's certainly individual publications. and There's even a number of vendors who are providing software to sort of help with establishing what we're calling risk-based monitoring. But it is new because we have to change our practices and change the way we think. And it's also new in terms of it was an initiative that was drafted now almost three years ago. And... And we really saw it come to the forefront. For example, ACRP at their global meeting two years ago held a, a town forum on this. And some of the experts from the industry came forward and talked about this. Does this mean less jobs? What does it mean? A change in the CRA role? And then finally the FDA finalized their guidance. But it's not just a U.S.-based initiative. So some of the other references I provided to you is the EMA reflection paper as well. And this one is the reflection paper on risk-based quality management as you can see, also finalized just last year, 18 November 2013. This is very similar to the concept that the FDA has put forward. And we also have the, the PMDA in Japan has also initiated a reflection paper on the same topic. Although it's still in, in transition and not finalized yet, the point is that this is really a changing trend. It is sort of the direction that the industry is going. So let's talk about this paper itself, this guidance for industry. But let me check in with you first. What do you think the intent is of the guidance on risk-based monitoring? Is it really to reduce the monitor workforce, save money on travel, make use of technology, or reduce sponsor responsibilities? What do you guys think? I'm just going to chat in a letter. Best guess? Is it A, B, C, D, or combination? All. Oh. Interesting. Okay. Good. And how about from Janet's group? What do you guys think? Whether well, they can't decide or that's so obvious they know the answer. But I think in a way we can th consider that maybe it is all of these things. It certainly isn't meant just as an initiative to save money on travel. Even if we reduce monitoring on site, it's not necessarily the driver of the initiative. And it's certainly not necessarily the driver of the initiative to reduce the monitor workforce although that could be an inadvertent side effect. And it's not a driver to reduce sponsor responsibilities because, as Janet said, D is not the correct answer, 
because that hasn't changed. 21 CFR Part 312 still talks about sponsor responsibilities. And if you're in the device world, 21 CFR 812 still discusses device responsibilities for the sponsor. So those haven't changed. Our lack of oversight has not changed. But one of the primary drivers is let's be smarter. Let's make use of technology to begin with because the industry has changed since the, regu since the FDA regulations were written and since ICHGCP was written and adopted. We've changed the way we do things, the way we collect data. We've also changed the fact that we can see things in real time. 